Many years ago, I worked in a small office. There were maybe uh, 10 or 11 of us uh, there, and I enjoyed working there. It was a, it was a good place to work, but uh, it wasn't too long before I realized that I was the only Christian uh, who worked there. And uh, in this office, we had a little bit of a tradition that every, uh, every Friday, we would all go to lunch together. And uh, we would go to various places, but uh, every once in a while, uh, the consensus would be that they wanted to go to Hooters. And so on those days, I would politely decline and uh, go eat lunch by myself. And uh, that was fine for a little while, but I think after a time, they noticed the pattern. And they came to me and they said, how come every time we go to Hooters, you don't want to go? And uh, I think they had a hard time, uh, uh, I think they had a hard, I'm sorry, could we turn off this clicking? Is that possible? I'm going to go forward. I'll, I'll, I'll find a way to ignore it. Um, I think they found it hard to... Um, uh, let me find my notes. I'm so sorry. I think they found it hard to accept the reasons why I didn't want to go. And at first, they tr- what they tried to do was they said, oh, it must be your wife, right? They said, oh, that Alicia, she's so strict and she keeps you on such a tight leash, right? And, and I said to them, I'm like, well, yeah, you know, I, it is about being married. It is that I don't, I don't want to go there because I don't want to dishonor my wife. I want to be respectful to her. But then um, I said, more than that, it's because I, I want to honor the Lord. I don't want to dishonor what God's Word said. And so that was then when they really kind of started to uh, push back, you know. And, uh, you know, I want to be clear. Like, I wasn't behaving like Angela from the office, right? I wasn't, I wasn't like giving people dirty looks. I wasn't judging them secretly or openly. I, w- I wasn't saying like, oh, you guys are so bad because you do that. I was really just keeping it to myself. They had come to me asking, and I was trying to give them... Uh, an honest answer. And, um, you know, I told them, like, look, I I feel like these restaurants objectify women in a sexual way, right? And and I said, look, it's it's not as grievous as, say, prostitution, but it's close enough that I don't want to be associated with that, right? And well, they really didn't like that answer. They started giving me all the regular objections of like, hey, the wings are great, right? Or they, they were saying like the, um, the, you know, bathing suits show more than those uniforms show. You know, those women, they choose to work there. They're making money. They're not being exploited. And uh, ultimately what it came down to was uh, they attacked me. They said, you know, I think the problem is you. Like, you, you should be able to be around, you know, a woman in a tank top and shorts and not ogle her, you know, and the problem is that you're a misogynist. And so they just didn't get it. And, you know, we moved past it for the most part, although I think I did make a couple of enemies in that office, uh, which was unfortunate. But the, the reality is my standard for personal holiness was offensive to them. And it was a wake-up call for me. It was my first time as a Christian where I really uh, came to realize, like, I'm significantly different than the rest of the people in the world. And, and it shouldn't have been surprising to me that they rejected me. Because these are all people who had, uh, who had rejected Jesus at some level, who had said, he's not for me. And, and I'm a person who, having devoted my life to following Jesus, uh, of course they're going to reject me too. So I, I don't know what life is like for you as Christians. You know, we're, we're living in an ever-increasing post-Christian world, they say. It, it's becoming less and less socially acceptable for us to be openly devout followers of Jesus Christ. 
right? Even in the South, right? Even in the Bible Belt. It, it, it seems like every day we're hearing about somebody, uh, some Christian who is being canceled in one way or another, often for stating a belief that until, you know, 15 minutes ago was just kind of a mainstream belief that everybody held, or at least people understood was a traditional Christian value. And if you're anything like me, the temptation is, the temptation is to compromise, right? Because I want everyone to like me. And I don't want there to be conflict between me and others. And I don't want to have confrontations. And I don't want my way of living to be interpreted as a judgment on other people's way of living. And I fear that if that was to happen, that it might hurt my witness, that it might hurt the gospel message to others. And so I'm always tempted to compromise. And today, we're, we're looking at two annual feasts that we see in Scripture uh, that God implemented for His people who were holy, who were set apart, the Hebrews. And they, these feasts are rem, were designed to remind God's people that they were holy. And the first feast, the Passover, it commemorated what God was about to do, right? God was finally going to free the people from slavery in Egypt. And uh, as Caroline prayed earlier, we see that it also served to point them forward to the coming Messiah, Jesus, on the cross. The second feast is called the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and it reminded God's people that they were not to allow the pagan culture that they had been steeping in for centuries to taint who they were as God's holy people. It's my hope that uh, today uh, we're going to find within this passage some bit of truth that we can imply in our own lives as we try not to be tainted by the culture that we're being steeped in. So first, I think we'll start by taking a look at the event, uh, the Passover, this event that happens uh, that God uses to inaugurate these annual feasts. So uh, the Passover event, uh, this is occurring as a part of that 10th plague, right? The final plague that God is bringing against Pharaoh. And I, I think we need to remember that this is uh, not just Pharaoh, right? This is Pharaoh and all the people of Egypt. From the beginning of Exodus, God has made it very clear that it's not just the king, it's everyone, and uh, we see in the very first chapter that uh, it was uh, God, uh, God's people were causing dread of the Israelites as they became more numerous. The Egyptian people were in dread, not Pharaoh. And then it says uh, God gives credit to all of the Egyptians for ruthlessly making the Jews work as slaves. And remember, after the Hebrew midwives kind of, you know, figured out a way that they weren't going to be committing infanticide on all the, the male uh, babies of, of the Israelites, right, uh, what did Pharaoh do? He expanded his edict so that all the people of Egypt, it was their job, if they saw an, a Hebrew boy, baby, they threw it in the Nile, uh, so this is not just Pharaoh, it's all of Egypt. It was just for the Lord to bring the plague upon all of them. And so Moses is now bringing this final warning. Uh, and remember last week we, we wrapped up where uh, Pharaoh, uh, Pharaoh had said to Moses, like, hey, if I ever see your face again, I'm going to execute you. And, and I think this is a continuation of that same conversation. I don't think he's left yet. And Moses is angry, right? He's all riled up. And, and frankly, I think Moses and Aaron were at their wits end, right? Um, imagine after all of these months, right, of all of these plagues befalling Egypt and time and time again being lied to and tricked by Pharaoh and Pharaoh never letting the people go. And now they're saying like, are you, are you kidding me, Pharaoh? 
you're going to let all this death and destruction come into your kingdom, you're really going to make this happen because you just won't obey. And we see in Exodus 11, you know, Mo Moses has given him the bad news, uh, thus says the Lord about midnight, I will go out in the midst of Egypt and every firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. From the firstborn of Pharaoh, even to the firstborn of the slave girl. There's going to be wailing in Egypt such as there never was or never will be again. And again, uh, Israel is going to be spared. And then, and this time, Mo Moses doesn't even say like, hey, and then, then hopefully you'll let him go. No, he says, this time it's going to happen. All your servants are going to come and bow down to me, and they're going to go. And then he left, and he, it said uh, he went out from Pharaoh in hot anger. Moses. The meekest man there ever was, says Scripture. After leaving Pharaoh, God has Moses now inform Israel, right? Like, hey, there's something that you're going to have to do if you want to avoid the same fate as the Egyptians. This is new. This is new. He, he goes in and he tells them uh, in Exodus 12, tell all the congregation of Israel, on the 10th day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household, and share with your neighbor if, if you're too small. Your lamb shall be without a blemish, a male, a year old. You may take it from a sheep or the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of the month, and then the whole assembly shall kill their lambs at twilight. And then they're going to take some of the blood and put it on the doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Is it significant that the Hebrews now had to do something in order to avoid the effects of the plague. Is that significant? I think so. See, in the previous six plagues, all they had to do was be Jewish, right? They, they were spared the effects of the strikes against Egypt. And Carte helped us see a couple weeks ago, God was demonstrating that he is the Lord who sustains his people. But that's not what he's doing right now. Because this last plague is actually aimed at everyone, Egyptians and Hebrews alike. God is executing judgments on all the gods of Egypt. And if we look in the book of Ezekiel in chapter 20, we see that God says this, on the day when I chose Israel, I swore to the offspring of the house of Jacob, making myself known to them in the land of Egypt. I swore to them, saying, I am the Lord your God. On that day, I swore to them that I would bring them out of the land of Egypt into a land that I had searched out for them, a land flowing with milk and honey, the most glorious of all lands. And I said to them, cast away the detestable things your eyes feast on, every one of you, and do not defile yourselves with the idols of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. But they rebelled against me and were not willing to listen to me. None of them cast away the detestable things their eyes feasted on, nor did they forsake the idols of Egypt. You see, God's people were just as guilty as their Egyptian oppressors. They were just as guilty of worshiping these false gods, these false idols. Not one of them deserved salvation. Not one of them had been faithful to God. And for this reason, if any Hebrew household had failed to put the blood of the Passover lamb on their doorframe, the destroyer would have been justified to come inside and kill the firstborn. So pay attention here. Hear this. God does not spare Israel's sons because they were better than the Egyptians, but because a spotless lamb died in their place. Do you see that? 
I wonder if some of us might be wondering, like, well, how, do, how does that even work? I remember thinking when I was a kid hearing about, you know, the sacrificial system uh, of ancient Israel and wondering, like, how, I don't get it. Like, how does killing a sheep, uh, you know, somehow take away a person's sins? I think it's actually a really good question, especially if you ever read the book of Hebrews, because you'll get to chapter 10 and verse 4, and it says this, it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. It's impossible to kill an animal and, and have that action um, take away your sins. That It's not possible. And so to understand this fully, I think we need to look at what God is instituting for his people from this day forward. And, and so we're going to look at the Passover as the feast. And the, the significance of, of, of what God is about to do, right? God taking his people out of Egypt. This, the, the significance of what all of this is pointing towards is so monumental that it resets time. God says, like, this is the beginning of the year from now on. And you're going to begin the, the year, right, with a week's-long feast. It's actually two feasts, and they're both designed to remind God's people of who He is and who they are. And it begins on the 10th day, right, when they take this spotless lamb and they keep it until the 14th. So imagine this, you take a lamb and you bring it into your house, and it's going to live with you for four days, right? So... Uh, uh, so maybe you like really get to get a good look at it and see, oh, it really is spotless. This really is a fine specimen of an animal, right? But I imagine like the kids probably loved having it around. <laughs> maybe they name it. Maybe they fall in love with it. But the lamb had one purpose, to be sacrificed on the 14th and its blood was to be put on the doorway, and then they were going to eat it. And this reminds us of how Jesus came, right? Jesus came and dwelt among us. We got to know him. He got to know us. We fell in love with him, and yet he died for us. Exodus 12, 8, they shall eat the flesh that night, Roasted on the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs, they shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted, its head with its legs and its inner parts, and you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it, with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste, because it is the Lord's Passover." Now, see, on that first Passover, they really had to be dressed to go. They, they actually had a very short window in which they could escape uh, from Egypt. But every subsequent year when they celebrated this feast, they continue the tradition of getting dressed as if they're going to go travel, their bags packed, ready to go, eating in haste. In verse 14, it says, this shall be a day for you uh, as a memorial day. You shall keep it as a feast throughout generations. As a statute, you shall keep it as a feast. And every year, Jews do this, uh, even today. They have a Passover meal. It's called a Seder. And Jewish people, they continue to honor it because it's still a statute for them. They gather to eat the Passover lamb, and they tell each other the story of how God freed the Hebrews from Egypt. You know, my family and I, we once were invited to a Seder uh, by some Hebrew friends of ours, and it was a really beautiful uh, ceremony, especially because our friends were also Christians. And so every element of the Seder, they would stop and they would say, here's how this represents Jesus. Here's how this points us towards the coming Messiah, and here is how Jesus is clearly that Messiah. And I remember uh, they talked about John the Baptist. And remember when John the Baptist first saw Jesus coming towards him, what did he say? He said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. 
And the Apostle Paul refers to Jesus as our Passover lamb in his first letter to the Corinthians. And, and I think it was no coincidence that Jesus himself instituted the sacrament of the Lord's Supper at a Passover Seder. See, he was about to make this once and for all sacrifice. He was about to spill his own blood for the sins of those who believed. And he said, essentially he was saying, it makes no sense to keep sacrificing animals that really does nothing, right? All it does is signify and foreshadow what is actually about to pass. And yet Jesus very much wants his chosen people, that now includes the Gentiles as well as the Jews, he very much wants us to continue to remember who he is and what he has done. And so now we have the Lord's table as a new memorial for God's chosen people. And we see this in Luke 22. When the hour came, he reclined at table and the apostles were with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. And then he took a cup and said, take this and divide it amongst yourselves. And he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. And the purpose of this sacrament is to serve as a continual reminder of God's deliverance of his people. Except now we have this greater understanding of what the exodus and the old sacrificial system in Israel was all about. You see, the believers in the Old Testament, they were not saved by the death of spotless lambs. They were saved by their faith in the spotless lamb, Jesus Christ, just like you and me. Everything that came before pointed towards the coming Messiah, Jesus Christ, and everything that has happened after has pointed back to the finished work of our Messiah, Jesus, on the cross. Because the penalty for our sin is death, and uh, those who believe are covered by the blood of the Lamb, the blood that Jesus shed while on the cross. And because of our faith in Him, God passes over us in judgment and we have eternal life. But just like those Israelites as they were coming out of Egypt, right, we live in a kind of in-between time, right, this kind of now and not yet time where Jesus has, has already died for our sins, and it is finished, and because we believe His eternal, we have eternal life with Him, that's assured. But until He returns and makes all things new, we continue to live in a broken world, and we continue to battle with our old sin nature. And that's what the second feast is all about. It's this, uh, the feast of unleavened bread is kicked off by the Passover. Here's what it says in Exodus 12, verse 15. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall remove leaven out of your houses, for if anyone eats what is leavened, from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. God knew that his chosen people would continue to struggle with all of the pagan nonsense that they had been exposed to during the centuries that they lived in Egypt. And really, it was worse than being exposed to, right? We already read in Ezekiel how they embraced the worship of these gods. And then God knew this also. He was about to impose on them the ceremonial and national laws of Israel, right? This whole new layer uh, of rules uh, that were designed to set his people apart and make them more distinct. It, it was going to be difficult enough for them to overcome their sin nature and try to adhere to the moral law, but they would have all these other burdensome laws as well. And so this Feast of Unleavened Bread, it was to happen every year, right when the year was starting, right when you're starting to contemplate your life and how things are going, there's this week-long celebration of being God's chosen people. But it was a reminder. It was a warning. 
that they needed to leave the leaven of Egypt behind. This was something that they struggled with, right? We know what happens. The people uh, who leave Egypt, they don't ever get to go into the promised land because they bring the leaven with them, right? And it's only their offspring who get to go into the promised land. But even their offspring struggle, right? They struggle to leave behind their Egypt. And eventually, they are taken out of the promised land and sent into exile. And we see when Jesus was rejected by the Jews in His day and crucified, this began a new era for God's people, for who was considered God's chosen people as Gentiles came to faith and God's holy church was planted. And those old ceremonial laws and national laws came to an end but yet God still calls His people to be holy. See, we've been set aside for a specific purpose through the Great Commission. And we're called to obey His moral laws still. But more than this, we're adopted into a family now, right? We're adopted into this community of believers where, where we are brothers and sisters together, And we're charged with loving one another. And for all of church history, this has been kind of counter-cultural. It's been difficult to accomplish. See, as we're called out of that slavery to sin that characterized our life before Christ, and we're called into freedom in the church, but we find it hard to leave Egypt behind. The Apostle Paul talks about Uh, protecting the purity and the unity of the church community, Uh, he uses the context of this feast of unleavened bread when he talks about it. In 1 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8, he says, your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival Not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. See, leaven is our sin, and the whole lump is not our body. The whole lump is the church, the whole body of Christ. And and Paul is setting malice, which is the intent to do harm to others, he's setting it over and against sincerity, which is the intent to... Uh, do good to others, and he sets evil, that which is not based on God's Word, over and against truth, that which is based on God's Word. Don't, Don't you think this is relevant to what's going on in churches today? Right? We, we see just a little bit of compromise is made about what is truth, about what God's Word says, and then before you know it, factions have formed, and malice starts to show its distorted face amongst God's people. Paul is saying we should celebrate the festival. We should acknowledge that we are God's chosen people set aside, and it means that we should remember things like Ephesians 2.10, that we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. See, that's what we've been set apart for, for good works, but not all by ourselves, not as individuals, but within this community of God. And within our church family, how are we to be known? By our love. Remember Jesus' words in John 13, All people will know you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And so we we have to kind of purge our community of the leaven, right? Because we're called to be holy as God is holy. And this, of course, is easier said than done. But that's where Christ comes in. He's set us free from the yoke of slavery. We're no longer trapped in our Egypt. Paul writes about this in Galatians. Uh, chapter 5, verse 1. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. 
See, true freedom is not freedom to do just whatever we want to do, right? It doesn't mean that we have unlimited choices. We can choose between anything that we want. I, I think of it kind of like this. Imagine that your hands are bound together and your feet are bound together, right? And you're laying on the ground and you're, you're unable to move. You're unable to do anything but lie there. And there is a bad man there and he's just kicking you. He just keeps kicking you. And there's nothing you can do. You can't resist. And then a good man comes along and sees what's happening. And what does he do? He unties your hands. He unties your legs. You're now free. You now have freedom. So now the, the bad guy's still there. He's still kicking at you. But now you can move away. You can get away from him. Or you can resist him. You're free to resist. You're free to do what is right. That's the kind of freedom that Jesus is calling us to. He's calling us to a freedom so that we can stand firm and resist the attacks of the enemy and do what is right. But of course we could, right? And we, and we so often do, right? We could curl up into a ball on the ground again and just let the bad guy start kicking us. Even though we have the freedom to fight back, we still do that. Freedom means we don't have to submit again to that yoke of slavery. Paul goes on in Galatians 5, he says, uh, I say to you, if you accept uh, circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. Every man who accepts circumcision is obligated to keep the whole law. You're actually severed from Christ if you would be justified by the law. You've fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything but only faith working through love. Only faith working through love. What Paul's talking about here is a particular yoke of slavery, okay? This is very relevant in our own culture. It's the primary lie of our culture, that we are responsible ourselves for our own salvation, that we can save ourselves by simply being good enough. Unbelievers, they try to live like this. They, they have their own uh, ethical code, and they try to live up to that code. And what's funny is they can't even live up to the code that they've set for themselves. But we do something maybe even more foolish. We think we can please God by keeping His laws, that we can somehow earn our salvation. But the problem is that the only works that matter are those being done by faith and in love. There is no good that we could do that will make God love us more. And there is nothing bad that we could do that would make God love us less. Because He chose us when we were still sinners. And He chose us knowing every good and bad thing we were ever going to do. There is no way that we can change the outcome. And so unless our works are done in gratitude for that, they have no value at all. And Paul wraps up in verse 9. He says, you were running well. Who hindered you? Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion was not from he who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. See, we're not constrained by the great number of Israel's specific laws that were set them apart. In fact, we have this great amount of Christian liberty within which we can operate. But nevertheless, we're told by Paul that we need to avoid those people in the culture and indeed those people in the church who would hinder us from obeying the truth. So, so what does it look like for us to avoid leaven? I have just three quick points of advice for us. The first is personal practice. Uh, 1 Timothy 4, 7 says, Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself in godliness. We need to train ourselves in godliness, folks. Uh, this is done by shunning the myths of the world and embracing the truth of God's Word. Essentially, we need to be curating the voices that we are allowing to have influence over us. 
And so it's probably not wise, and church, I am preaching to myself here, but it's probably not wise to allow an algorithm or unseen, unknown people to control what we see and hear, whether that's on social media or in our news feed or in our networks. It doesn't mean that we have to put ourselves in a bubble or live in an echo chamber where we only hear, you know, approved Christian voices. But what it means is we need to pay attention to what and who we are hearing. And we need to compare that against what we know to be true, Amen. the Word of God. It's important that we train ourselves how to think about things critically and that we use the Word of God as the basis for determining what is good and what is true. And the only way to be able to do that is to know what God's Word says, to meditate on it daily, and to make a practice of putting it into practice in our life. Second, we need to have accountability with one another. James 5.16 says, confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. And Galatians 6, 1 and 2 says, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness, but keep watch on yourself lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. See, our journey towards holiness is not meant to be walked alone. It's not just us and God. It's us and God and the church that he's placed us in. The scripture is full of one another's, right? They are commanding us to involve others in our lives. Now, hear this, not everyone, not everyone is safe. You have to find people who are trustworthy. But you know, our motto here at New City Church is to live, uh, that it's better to live found out than be found out, right? We need to be known by others, Amen. truly known. And I'll say this, if, if, if there is no one outside of your home who truly knows what it is that you tend to struggle with, with sin, if there's no one outside of your home who knows that, you, you need to give some attention to this. You need to find a friend or a confidant, someone trustworthy. You're joining a discipleship group or finding a missional community that's often a good step towards finding people like this. And then finally, I would say uh, church discipline. Hebrews 13, verses 7 and 17, they, they say this, Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy Amen. and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. God has put church leaders in your life and in my life to speak the word to us, to be an example to us, at least as much as they themselves are imitating Christ, right? And to watch over our souls. Many of us, we naturally resist authority. But God says that church leaders are an advantage to us. And I know you can't, you can't scroll through two pages of Spotify, right, without finding a podcast that wants to tell you how some church somewhere has hurt someone. But here's the thing. The church is never going to be perfect. You know why? Because it's made up of people. People who are limited and people who make mistakes, even our leaders, you know, at New City, we're not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but we really do strive to be a safe and healthy place for our people. And just remember this, ultimately, Scripture says that the church is the bride of Jesus Christ. He loves her. He's sanctifying her. She's going through a process. Your holiness is a part of that. My holiness is a part of that. 
And as we both take care to remove the leaven from our own lives within this community of the church, we will only get holier, we'll only get safer until that day that Christ returns. Hey, Pastor Ryan here. We're so glad that you've tuned in with us and watched one of our online sermons. Our vision as a church is to live as the family of God together, proclaiming and demonstrating the gospel of grace to one another in our city. If you don't have a church home or you're looking for a church, we'd invite you to attend one of our in-person worship gatherings so you can experience all that God has for us as a community of believers on mission.